Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, top 10 unscripted Monty Python moments that were left in. Preemptive, like Watch Mojo UK. My name's Connor. If you're new, easy Watch Mojo video, fun times. Let's go. Anybody else feel like a little Biggest... giggle? When I, when I mention my friend. Welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we're counting down our pay. People told me I just don't believe it. How, that like you would, they wouldn't get paid if they laughed or something like that. <laughs> Welcome Which to does Watch make Mojo it a bit UK, more funny. And today we're counting down our picks for the top ten unscripted Monty Python moments that were left in. For a this duck. list, we're looking at Sorry. the improvised scenes or lines from Monty Python films, specials, and flying circus that made it into the. Final versions. My favorite quote from Monty Python. Okay. Very small rocks. <laughs> Before we begin, we publish new content every day. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. I had to say that right before. Okay. The intro. Let's go. Number 10, where are we? Monty Python Live, mostly. The comedy troupe's final live performance, mostly together, in 2014, offers a few unscripted moments. The first of these is during the performance of Crunchy Frog. Mr. Milton, played by Terry Jones, describes the various disgusting confections of the Whizzle Chocolate Company. Whipped into a fondue and garnished with mouse poo. This causes Terry Gilliam's constable parrot to become increasingly ill, eventually vomiting in his helmet. Moment. That's where things go off the rails. You pop it into your mouth, stainless steel boat, spring out, and punch straight through both cheeks. Well, where's the pleasure in? <laughs> when Gilliam breaks, please quips that he'll be Constable X Parrot, referencing the famous dead parrot sketch. You'll be a Constable X Parrot. He then breaks himself, wondering which part they left off on. The live format leads to several of these off-the-cuff moments. Where are we? Can you remember? <laughs> Number 9. Cracking Up, Monty Python Live, Mostly. This live show's run also featured the aforementioned Dead Parrot sketch. It's an iconic sketch Classic. with a Mr. Praline, no, it isn't. not Inspector, trying to return a clearly deceased bird, which he was sold recently, to a pet shop. No, it isn't. However, Sir Michael Palin and John Cleese each do their best. I get the frustration with Watch Mojo sometimes. <laughs> with like because i want to just hear the scenes of each of the things they're bringing up okay i get that but i don't i don't have a but to make okay. each other laugh throughout the performances an ex parrot <laughs> This results in both of them breaking character several times, and even forgetting lines because they're too tickled. Wait, wait, wait. You say, uh, now that's what I call a dead parrot. Now that's what I call a dead parrot! While the direction of the sketch may have ceased to be, we'll gladly laugh along with them until we join the choir invisible. Number eight, lousy song. Monty Python sings it. Whenever I saw the... Uh... The Dead Parrot skit, it was accompanied by the Lumberjack song skit. And I wonder if that was just a coincidence of the video I watched on YouTube, or if they were actually paired together in any meaningful way. In the I don't choir know. invisible. Number eight, lousy song, Monty Python sings again. This previously unreleased song or sketch was completely ad-libbed. What are you up to? Oh, oh, just listening back to the song. The birds on the wing. In an interview with The Guardian, Eric Idle revealed that the sketch was improvised by him and the late Graham Chapman. The pair of them talk over an orchestral ballad he'd recorded, with Chapman lambasting the song as terrible for about two solid minutes. Uh, and who's the singer? You're it's me. <laughs> it's you? Yeah. I recommend people avoid this. Singing? The back and forth between the two is quite funny, American? with Idol even thanking Chapman for his not-so-constructive criticism. They eventually decide to go and have a drink. Whether you think the song is lousy or not, the sketch is absolutely smashing. You're saying my song is terrible? Yes, I am. I think I'm over. It's done. Number seven, Twirl, Monty Python's Life of Brian. Oh, back up on our next level. Did you say it? In this biblical satire film, the titular Brian, 
played by Chapman, is approached by a beggar on the street. The man, played by Palin, claims to be a former leper. Jesus cured him, which the man is rather put out about. As a beggar, leprosy brought in the coin. <laughs> Brian eventually pays him, though not as much as the man would like. Well, if my livelihood's gone, not so much as I buy your leave. You're cured, mate. Bloody do good up. Well, why don't you go and tell him that you want to be a leper again? It's a hilarious scene, <laughs> but all the dialogue was scripted. The improvised moment happens at the end, which Palin revealed in a Reddit AMA. As Palin is walking away, he notices some donkey droppings on the ground and does a last minute spin to avoid them. That's what Jesus said, sir! Thankfully, <laughs> it only adds to the quirkiness of the ex-leper. Number six, <laughs> the moose. Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. It's one of the little men from Death. the village. Oh. Death is part of life, and a part of the meaning of life. The film, at least. In this segment, the Grim Reaper visits a clueless dinner party. Despite all the evidence, it takes a while for them to accept that they've all kicked the bucket. Death eventually reveals the cause of their deaths. The salmon moose. The salmon moose. Darling, you didn't use canned salmon, did you? I'm most dreadfully embarrassed. While most of this scene is as scripted, the punchline was not as originally written. So Michael Palin again delivers an apparent ad lib as the dinner guests all depart for the afterlife. Hey, I can eat the moose. Number five, long pause, <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The oh my God, the best part. Bridge of Death is great, but this is the best part of the movie, of many great parts of the movie. Which burning scene from this pseudo medieval comedy is full of hysterical and the nose. And quotable lines? That's Polly. You just wrote like this. No! 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 no, no, no. A bit. no. Yes, 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 yeah, 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 a bit, a bit. But one of its unscripted moments is completely silent. An angry mob asks Sir Bedivere to burn a woman, believing she's a witch. Very small terribly rocks. faulty logic, Bedivere tries to connect witches burning with them having the properties of wood. However, when he tries to nudge the crowd into sharing his conclusion, the villager played by John Cleese pauses quite a while before answering. So, why do witches burn? Because According to the commentary track for the film, Cleese took extra long that particular take. Eric Idle even tries to bite his scythe to keep from laughing. Because I'm made of wood. Good. We can hardly blame him. You'd have to be made of wood not to laugh at the scene. The best part. I don't know why is they're asking what else floats. And someone says very small rocks. <laughs> I don't know. That was so funny to me. Number four, not like the others. Monty True. Python's Life of Brian. Life of Brian brilliantly satirizes oh. blind faith and dogma more so than faith itself. I don't really want to. One of the scenes that best illustrates this is when Brian speaks to his unwanted followers outside his window. He tries to dissuade them from following him, asking that they all think for themselves, as they're all unique. However, one man pipes up and exclaims that he's not different, ironically making him seem both more and less unique than the rest of the crowd. According to Python biographer Kim Howard Johnson's blog, this line was improvised by Terence Baylor, one of the repertory company members from the film, who Is suggested the line and got approval to shout it out. Quite the achievement for a non-Python. Number three, must be a king, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Holy Grail really plays up the misery and squalor of medieval life. Bring out your bread. <laughs> To that end, this famous scene features a dead collector, played by Eric Idle, arguing with a man played by John Cleese, who tries to pass off his still-living father as dead to get rid of him. Their mundane haggling over a man's life like it's rubbish is hilariously dark, as is the conclusion, which sees the collector club the father over the head. I feel happy! I feel he looks happy. around. <laughs> But what comes afterwards is actually an ad lib, as revealed in the commentary track. When King Arthur comes tromping through the village, Idle remarks, There's a commentary track over the whole film with the actors?
remarks that he must be a king due to a lack of, let's say, feces about his person. Who's that then? I don't know. Must be a king. Go on. He hasn't got shit all over him. <laughs> Number two, stolen wallet. Monty Python's flying circus. And then I found my wallet had been stolen and £15 pounds taken from me. Sometimes simplicity leads to the greatest comedy. This short sketch sees a man played by Michael Palin approach a policeman, John Cleese. He tells the policeman that his wallet has been stolen. The officer cannot do much though, since the man didn't see anybody nearby. Do you want to come back to my place? <laughs> The man then asks if the policeman wants to come back to his place, which the officer is surprisingly receptive to. According to an interview with Michael Palin by We Are Cult, the entire scene was improvised between the two of them on camera. It may have been off the cuff, but the scene and punchline make several appearances in later Python properties, and it never gets old. Do you want? Do you want? Want? Do you want, do you want to come back to my place? Number one. God. Actors are more important than writers is what I'm getting from this video. Giggles. Monty Python's Life of Brian. You find it visible? It was true. When I say the name, Dickus. Dickus. Ah, yes, the famous Biggest Dickus scene. In Life of Brian, the lisping Pontius Pilate, another Michael Palin character, is incredulous that anyone could think the name Biggest Dickus would be made up. He has a friend of that name. Naturally, his guards can't keep straight faces or dry noses, given such a ridiculous premise. Although some sources suggest the guards act as... Look how much he loves that. <laughs> Look how much he loves the fact that he realizes everyone can't keep a straight face. Weren't informed of in such a ridiculous premise. Although some sources suggest the guards' actors weren't informed of the scene beforehand, according to Palin's own diary notes, he had to keep improvising during the scene to keep them laughing. She's called Incontinentia. Incontinentia buttocks. These ad libs included names for Biggest Dickus' wife, as well as his final command for the guards to blow their noses and seize Brian. And we're glad he did, since these touches make the scene even funnier. Seize him! Seize him! Blow your noses and seize him! Do you agree with our pigs? I fully believe this one because of the way he's acting. That, like, he starts to feel like it feels like he's kind of straight faced, and then he notices everyone can't stop laughing, and then he takes joy in it. Like this. I know this. <laughs> given such a ridiculous premise. Love y'all. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, chin up if you're not. You'll be good soon. Don't worry. Or, you know, maybe not. Love y'all. See you guys next time. Bye.